Today, I would not like to tell you a story. Today, I would like to build a practical, evidence-based case about why we need to rethink the way that we build and the way that we manage our business. We are human, and we often use conventional wisdom when it comes to managing our people. We know by fact that this conventional wisdom does not really work in our days. In our research, we examine why people are doing what they are doing every day at work. What drives them? What keeps them going? What gives them energy? We also examine how people are doing what they're doing and what is the ideal work that we should be given to them in order for them to be at their best every day. We look at their life priorities, what people are looking from their lives as we speak. And when we put all these four things together, then we realize that data becomes almost alive and show us what people need to do to better understand, communicate, and connect with one another. This little piece of technology that I am showing you on the screen, it's called Pager. Pagers never really made it in this part of the world, at least not mainstream. And the reason why is because mobile phones arrived before this technology came here. So who would like to use a pager rather than a mobile phone? So this region skipped over the technology of pagers directly to mobiles. A similar thing, it looks like it's happening when it comes to how we access internet. The world learned, the developed world, learned to access internet through wires and desktop computers. But it, looked like, it looks like the developing world goes directly to mobile. Who would like to use wires and desktops when they can go online through their mobile phones? And when I see these things, there is a question that comes into my mind. Why, when it comes to managing our companies and our people, we cannot just make the jump, the leap, into what we know that works best today, not in the past? Why are we cut in the spaces in between? Today, we separate our people in those that have and those that have not. I'm not talking about socioeconomic segmentation here. I'm talking about what we believe that they have talent and knowledge and those that we believe that they don't. Richard Florida in 2002 helped us understand this new kind of worker that comes into the workplace today called the creative class. We also know these people by the name of knowledge workers. Knowledge workers do not fit in a command and control organization. And with this, I will take you through busting the first myth of the day. Myth number one, business efficiency has increased over time. Due to technology and digital infrastructure that has gone so far, it makes no, it is no brainer that companies should have become super efficiency by today. Researchers took a, bit, a deep look in financial data to understand how good and how efficient we are today. They found out some amazing findings. The first thing they found out is that companies that do well in our economic environment, they cannot keep their efficiency for long. And this suggests that what we learn gets obsolete quickly. They also found out that companies that do not do well they destroy value faster than ever. They found out that companies that hold leadership positions for years lose them faster than ever. The total rate of leaders has doubled. And the most striking of all, they found out that the returns on assets, a key performance indicator that shows how companies capture and deliver value to their shareholders, has been dropped into one-fourth of the same indicator back in 1965. What is this myth with efficiency? Our companies are not doing well. Our companies are not doing better than they used to back in 1965. There is no doubt that the value is created. Take a look at this slide. The top line indicates labor productivity. We have become more productive because of technology and digital infrastructure. The bottom line shows the efficiency, return on assets. 
there is value created. Where does this value go? It transforms into salaries for the creative class and into power to the consumers. Consumers become more powerful and become more brand disloyal as never before. So moving forward to our next myth, I would like to make a note here that shareholders put tremendous pressures on CEOs to capture this value and give it back to them, give them their fair share. So myth number two is about CEOs. Myth number two is about your more, most important employee is the CEO. There is a deeply held belief that in our companies, the most important people live atop at the sweet sea. We imagine our CEO strategize, building plans, take us to battle and come back victorious, or we are afraid that if he falls, we, might fall, we may fall with him. Now I know that this example might be a little bit of a cliche, Steve Jobs and Apple, everybody is using them, but there is a point I want to make here. I believe that the most important contribution of, of Steve Jobs when he was creating the company with the largest valuation in the corporate history is that he created an organization that can continue being successful without him. When we focus on celebrity CEOs mostly, we fail to see the contributions of the rest of our people at the workplace. We also send the wrong message. See it from this perspective. Everyone is a CEO in his own department and in his own team. But what happens when we send the wrong message to the base? More than 60% of the employees surveyed said that they want to quit their bosses. They find them arrogant, they find them volatile, emotionally volatile, distrustful of others, and they want just to leave their jobs. More than 60% of people holding leadership positions today will fail because of interpersonal behavior flaws. This is an amazing number. When we research the, 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 when we researched the region with our system, we found out that executives prefer to work in a reserved manner. They prefer fingers and numbers more, more than working with people. In a place and in a marketplace where human interactions are the most important part of our business, this is a behavior that we need to re-examine. And this brings us into the next myth. Myth number three. Invest in your high potential people. High potential for what? Potential for filling in jobs that they may not exist in 10 years from today? We live in a world that changes rapidly. What we know today will get obsolete faster than ever. Success is more about how quickly we learn, we capture knowledge, and we convert it into value, and rather on how we manage routine, repeated tasks. Our world has changed from jobs that were for the agricultural period to industry, to manufacturing, to services. From converting raw materials into finished goods into tacit jobs that require knowledge and judgment and dealing with uncertainty. They require complex interactions. More than 80% of the jobs in the Western world today are about complex interactions. Only 20% of them are about routine tasks. Today, our most valuable workers are those that they can do the job well, that they can handle complex interactions with people. And that brings us into myth number four. Young people are ready to lead. Well, ask them, and they will say they are. But the truth is that our places, workplaces, are not ready to accept them. Scott Kaufman and Jennifer Cassell, writers of a very successful book in the United States called The Secrets of Young and Successful, researched young people for the past 10 years. I joined them back in 2006. Our research shows that Generation Y, the millennials, are an amazing kind of people, but they are completely different than us. They grew up with technology and video heroes. They watched parents plan every single activity of their childhood. They formed their characters listening to other people telling them, you're special, you can do anything you want. 
We train them to ask questions. We train them to status, to, to challenge the status quo. And this is why, what they return to us when it comes to the workplace. 88% of them want to learn at work. 50% of them want to have a job that they love. They rather not have a job if they don't like it. 76% want to cheat their boss. They believe that they are technology savvy and their bosses have a lot of things to learn from them. 71% want a second family at work. 75% want a mentor. And 90% they want their ideas to be listened. Does this sound like our workplace today? Does this sound that we are ready to accept them and give them the possibilities to develop and lead our organizations? I don't think so. There are two billion of them coming into the markets. Today, as we speak, 25% of the workforce in the United States, it's millennials. Every day, 10,000 of them turn 21. They will be soon flooded our workplaces. We are not ready. The biggest difficulty these people have, the young people, is that they cannot handle difficult people situations. Why? Because we train them like that. They are very good with computers and with machines, but they cannot handle difficult people situations. We will need to help them develop. One would say that money is enough. We can buy them in and we can spend money to keep them. Well, let's challenge this myth as well, because this is one of the most important ones. Myth number two, money can buy you more effort. Well, here, science is really interesting, very surprising. I'm going to use an experiment that was done in MIT a few years ago by Dan Ariely to bring some light into this myth and also research evidence from our research in the world and in the region. I will use this science to question the idea that if you reward something, you get more of the behavior that you want. And if you punish something, you get less of the behavior that you want. The carrot and the stick rule that has been serving us so well in the industrial era. So while these people conducted their research, they found out that when the task involves only mechanical skill, meaning moving boxes from one side of the stage to the other, then reward led into the desired outcome. More money, better performance. When the, the task required minimum co cognitive effort, more money led into lower performance. What does this mean, basically, is that you cannot reward people with money when you ask them to use their brains. Our research, when we are looking at the hidden motivators of people in the world and in the region, shows that most of them, in the United States, for example, or in Latin America, in Eastern Europe, are mostly motivated by freedom, by being able to do things at work freely. In Asia, they are motivated by helping other people, while in this part of the world, they are motivated by being unique, by, being put, by putting their fingertips in everything that they do. One, every three employees in the world will stay in their current job, two of them will fly. That comes from a survey of 170,000 people around the world. This is a message that we are receiving, that we are not doing something right. Ladies and gentlemen, we are cutting the spaces in between. We need a paradigm shift to be able to prepare our businesses and the workplace to accept knowledge workers and give them the possibility to be happy at work and unleash their full potential. We need to help them better understand, communicate, and connect with one another. Thank you very much.